Welcome to anyone that's going to be watching this later online on YouTube. Uh, lovely to have you with us on the journey and excited to be able to take us into the next step of this mini-series that we're in that Ryan kind of launched us into last week. Wasn't that amazing? And so if you missed that last week, I really please, please uh, go back and watch that and engage with it um, because when it comes to our core values as a church, you know, those things that we want to be the, the sort of deep, lasting influences in our hearts and lives and ministries, the way we do things as a church, what Ryan shared last week really does get to the absolute center of what it's all about. If you did miss it, as I say, we're in this short three-part series, so this is week two, and we're going to do other little mini-series like this throughout the course of the year, where we look at the things that really make us tick as a church, uh, those things that we see as being vitally important, the things as a ministry team that we are leaning into and praying into and praying for, the things that we'll be calling all of us, because None of us are there yet, myself included. And so these aren't things that are fully formed and established in us yet. Unfortunately, we wish they were. But they are the vision values, if you like, that we have. Those things that we want to be praying into and prioritizing. The, va the values that we hope are going to be increasingly celebrated and loved uh, by us as a community and as a church. So... If I were to kind of summarize the value for this mini-series, it's really this, that in all things, we take our lead from Jesus. That's really what this is all about for these next couple of weeks. The, the way we've articulated that uh, is like this. Click. No. Click. There's only one. Really? <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, you know, I've got all my slides here, so it's great for me. You will have to be with me and have your Bibles open so that we can go to those different sites. So, core values, we believe that Jesus is our model and example in purity and character, in intimacy and relationship with the Father and the Spirit, and in ministry to people. And because we don't have the slide, I'll read that one more time. We believe that Jesus is our model and example, those are really critical words, in purity and character, in intimacy and relationship with the Father and the Spirit, and in ministry to people. Kind of three dimensions to that. And I guess a key that we want to draw out this morning is that to be a Christian according to the Bible, is to become a disciple, or to use modern language, an apprentice to the life and teachings of Jesus. It's to the life and the teachings of Jesus. And that Jesus' vision for the church is that we would be a family of people learning to live with him and live like him in the world that we find ourselves in today. And we really see this, one of the places we see this is in the Great Commission. So if you have your Bibles with you, uh, Matthew chapter 28, uh, you can go there. I'm going to read from verse 18. So Matthew chapter 28 is kind of the first uh, of the, the Gospels in the New Testament, if you have a Bible and you're wanting to find it. Okay, so you get to the New Testament and you get to the end of the first book there, and you'll come to Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, what's interesting is the way that we can look at this passage. I keep pointing, it's not there. The way that you can look at your passage in front of you. Because we can see ourselves in two ways. 
The first is we can see ourselves as the disciples here in the passage receiving this commission from Jesus. And if you like, as we do that, we experience Jesus giving to us the guiding command for the mission of the church for all time until he comes again. This is, if you like, God's mandate to us as his disciples. And we're going to explore that over the next kind of couple of months in our connect groups, which is really exciting because there is both promise and there is instruction and there is vision and there's God's heart in this. And so we're going to dive into that in our connect groups. Another way that you can look at this passage is from the perspective of those who are going to be reached. And we can put ourselves into that place, that we are the people who the disciples were coming to reach. And in that way, we get a vision for our life. So imagine for a moment, you know, Peter and John, they're there with Jesus. They're receiving the commission. And then in a moment, bang, God teleports and time travels them into the room this morning. Okay, at which point I graciously step aside and let them take over, which I absolutely would. And what would they do? They would look out at you and me, and they would see people for whom now they are able to fulfill this commission of Jesus to make us disciples of Jesus and to teach us to obey everything that he had taught them. Do you see how that would work? And so if you like, sort of built into this, we get to see just from this passage, God's plan, at least in part, for our lives, that we would become Jesus' disciples and that we would do everything that he had commanded his disciples to do and obey him in all of those things. So I guess a question, though, for us is, what is a disciple? That's kind of strange language for us, isn't it? We we don't generally use the word disciple outside of our Christian circles. And so what is it? Well, here's a definition. A disciple, and this is a broad definition because the word was a broadly used word, is an apprentice who chooses to follow, learn, and become like their teacher or master, or rabbi, to imitate their life and to imitate their teaching. The Greek word that we translate disciple literally means to be an apprentice. And one of the things I think that we can struggle with is we hear the word disciple, and I think we think learner, particularly in this passage in uh, the Great Commission where there's an emphasis on teaching, which is a big part of it. But if we were to think of a learner, imagine a pupil at a university or a pupil in a school. And they would come in, and the lecturer would come, or the teacher would come, and they'd begin to teach them, and they would begin to learn. But we wouldn't expect the learner in that context to also imitate the lifestyle of their lecturer. You know, in fact, sometimes we might hope that they don't imitate the lifestyle of their lecturer. Some of you are thinking, my children, I don't want them maybe living like their teachers. You know, they can do what they say, but don't do what they do. You know, it's, however... That would be a completely foreign concept to this idea of becoming a disciple of Jesus. The idea was, I commit my life often to live with my rabbi. You would live with the rabbi so that you could see the way they live and copy the way they live and then receive and take on board their life and their teaching. You know, I was thinking about this with me and how different that is in the way that we do things today. You know, you don't all live with me, (laughs) okay? You know, that would be strange, I guess. But one of the things that means is you get, most people get to see me teach, but you don't get to see me live. And so you get to hear the things I say and the teachings that I bring, but not often to see the lifestyle that perhaps supports some of it. And I'm not saying that I'm getting it perfectly right, but there are things in my life that hopefully mirror and imitate the lifestyle of Jesus, just as they are for you. And so as we can recognize those things, the lifestyle and the teaching, that is what it is to become an apprentice. It's taking on board the values, rhythms, priorities, and teachings. Think of the early church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, but they also devoted themselves to one another. 
and to fellowship and meeting together every day and watching how the disciples lived, the apostles lived, watching how one another lived because for them to be a Christian was as much a way of life as it was a set of beliefs. The two actually go hand in hand together. So, for example, if you're in your Bibles, you can jump forwards a little bit to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. So that's just out of the Gospels. If you progress forwards a bit past John and, and Acts, and then you get to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And this is Paul now writing to a church that you know, was really struggling with a lot of things. When we come to the letter to the Corinthian church, we've got to have in our mind, this is a broken church in a lot of ways. They're really struggling with a lot of things. So much of this letter is corrective and answering questions and speaking into issues. Okay, so we don't have the full kind of picture here. We've got Paul correcting some of the things that aren't quite right in the church. And he writes in chapter 4, verse 15 to 17, even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, some of your translations might say tutors or teachers, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you, look at this, to imitate me. For this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. So I'm not sure if you can see the connection there. He's saying, I have, I have showed you my way of life. And I have given you the teachings. And they actually connect together. If you like, they're like breathing. So we breathe in and we breathe out. They are inseparable, and yet they are slightly different processes, aren't they? To breathe in and to breathe out. To receive God's truth and to imitate the lifestyle of Jesus and the apostles. And so if you try to live out the teachings of Jesus without copying the lifestyle of Jesus, it's a bit like trying to grow apples without a tree. It's, try, it's like trying to have fruit without the vine. It just doesn't make sense. The fruit has to hang on something, and what the fruit hangs on is the life and lifestyle of Jesus. Okay, we're going to go forwards a little bit further in the New Testament. Well done, all of you, for tracking with this in your Bibles. Excellent. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Don't feel any shame about using the contents page in the Bible. We've all done it. Okay, so but a, a, few, a few books ahead, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 4 says this. Now, this is different to Paul writing a corrective letter. This is now Paul writing a kind of commendation of praise. Well done, guys. You are actually getting it right here. Verse 4, for we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. There's another core value in there, which we won't touch on this morning. Okay, you know how we lived among you for your sake. You became, here's the key, imitators of us and of the Lord. For you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia, and I would say to all of us as well. So he says, you know how we lived. You became imitators of us and imitators of Jesus, and so you became a model to everybody else. They modeled the lifestyle as well as the teaching. He's saying, you didn't just believe, you followed, you copied, you imitated. You saw the way we lived, and you put it into practice. So here's a challenge for us, though. How do we recognize the ways of Jesus, the lifestyle of Jesus, and begin to bring that into our lives today? Because there are some differences, aren't there? Okay, because, you know, Jesus was a man. 
So that's different to some of you in the room, okay? He lived thousands of years ago. That's different to all of us. He was a rabbi, which I guess I can connect with a little bit, although even that is different. He didn't have a wife or children, never had to sit in traffic, you know, or up early for the tube, didn't face the temptations of a smartphone, didn't have the distractions of Netflix and Amazon Prime and Disney Plus and whatever else it is. And so how do we, I mean, it was in many ways the same world, but a different world that he lived in. So how do we learn to see the ways of Jesus so that we can imitate his lifestyle in this very different world that we are living in today. So here's a little worked example for us. Now, there are many ways of Jesus. And as I said earlier, this is a journey where we get to incrementally learn to live like him. And so that is a big process. And every time we come closer to doing it, we actually get to live into the greater joy of the kingdom. And so that it's, it's like layers, and every step we can come closer to that. But this is a sort of foundational way that I thought I could show you as a bit of a worked example so we can know how to read the Bible, not just to get the teachings of Jesus, but also the lifestyle that we can begin to copy it. So Luke chapter 4, you've got to go back in your Bibles. Isn't it handy when we have it on the screen? You can do it so quickly. Now you're having to navigate this book or your app. You're doing great. Okay. So Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. And this is quite a well-known section of the Gospels because this describes the first outing, if you like, of Jesus as he steps into his public ministry. So this is a really significant moment. Often in the Bible, as you get the first of something, it becomes very significant because it sets the pattern for every other time that topic is looked at. Um, because the Bible is a finite thing, <laughs> it, it often doesn't define itself every time. So you read about it in detail once. We have one creation story. Every time that's referenced, the implication is we know that creation story and we've brought it into the way we're understanding this section. So every time something new is introduced in the Bible, it becomes, if you like, a pattern for us to be able to understand every subsequent time that issue is raised. So that's just a helpful way of remembering how to read. That's why the first time you read the Bible, you get a lot out of it. The second time you get a lot more because you now have the keys to understand the rest. If that makes sense. Okay, so here we have the first sort of section of ministry of Jesus. So this is really formative for us in understanding how he does life and how he lives the way that he does. And what is interesting is that you will see at the beginning, there is this moment as Jesus goes into the wilderness. The Holy Spirit leads him into the wilderness to fast to overcome the enemy, the temptations that come against him. We know from Matthew that after he overcomes, he's then restored. The angels come to minister to him. And then in Luke, as you read on, you see he comes out of the wilderness in the power of the Holy Spirit. So he goes, he's led into the wilderness. He has this time of conflict, sort of uh, inner conflict and temptation, the temptation of the enemy. He comes away from that time restored and empowered by the Holy Spirit. He then goes into his ministry, you know, he takes out the scroll, he reads the scroll, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. It goes on from there, there's deliverance, he goes to the next town, everybody is healed. Basically, imagine revival. Okay? So he comes out of the wilderness, steps into ministry, bang, it's like the kingdom of God is center stage. And then we have the next moment where it says, and he went away in the morning to a solitary place to pray. Now, the word wilderness and solitary place or quiet place in the Greek language is the same word. It's the eremos, the wilderness, the alone place. And so the first, we get a detailed explanation of it. The second, we just told he does it again. And the idea is we're meant to think, okay, so Jesus goes into the wilderness 
there is this time of kind of conflict. He overcomes the enemy. Much of what we face when we try to be alone with God is the spiritual and inner wrestle of how can I be alone with God? Am I worthy? I, but I've done these things. All our past kind of gets reminded to us. Where do we think that comes from? <laughs> okay, the accuser of the brethren. Then it's like, how are we going to deal with that? You know, can I deal with the distraction? Can I hear from God? As we overcome that and we come close to God, we receive his restoration, we become empowered, we leave with his perspective, we leave with his strength and his power, and we get to step into our work week, whatever that looks like now, with the power and conviction and strength of the Holy Spirit, and then we get to do it all again. And this, if you like, becomes this pattern. And if you jump to chapter 5, verse 16, just over the page perhaps, we get a little summary statement. So this is really trying to bed this in for us, this lifestyle of Jesus. Uh, so chapter 5, verse 16, he frequently withdrew to the wilderness, the eremos, the quiet place, to pray, to overcome the enemy, to deal with the temptation to be restored in God, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and to come out and do the will of the Father. And something in this is meant to trigger in us a question as we come before. Like the disciples said, Jesus, would you teach us to pray? We're meant to see this lifestyle of Jesus and say, Jesus, would you teach us to be alone with you? Would you teach us to go, if you like, into our eremos, our quiet place, our place where we're not distracted because we find that hard, and I think we find it increasingly hard to switch everything off. Now, this doesn't mean you have to go to the country if you want to have a quiet time with God. But the idea is, what's the way? What is Jesus doing here? He's saying, I get away from everybody else. I get away from the distraction. I kind of switch everything else off because there is something about the grace of the wilderness, the grace of being alone with God. This is the only place we can find this kind of empowering and restoration. And if we try to live the Christian life without learning how to do wilderness time with God, it's a bit like trying to drive a car without an engine. There is just no power in it. There's no drive. Imagine Jesus had not done this. Imagine he hadn't done that. And he'd come to ministry without the power of the Holy Spirit. What did they always say about him? Here is one who teaches with authority and power. And all the ministry, the driving out of the, the, the evil spirits, the healing. Of the, if there was no power to his ministry, how different would it have been? If there's no power to our lives, if there's no strength, if there's no inner conviction, very easy to be manipulated, to be thrown around. The crowds could have put on him their own agendas and perspectives. I think they came looking for Jesus at the end of Luke chapter 4 because they were thinking, you know what, Jesus, this is pretty good. What's happening right now, this revival? Everyone's being healed. You know, it'd be really great if you could just stay here and camp. And he comes out saying, no, I've got to go to the next town and the next town and the next town. And he leaves the Aramos with the perspective of God, his father, and is then able to live into that. So this is just one of the ways of Jesus that we are called not just to know but to begin to live into and to copy. And there are many others. And if I had the slide, I'd show you. <laughs> and and the, the core value is trying to get at some of those big headings, the things that relate to the way Jesus relates to his Father, the way he relates to the Holy Spirit. Think about the way Jesus prays not just what he prays, as we've been talking about. The way he submits and surrenders in the garden. The garden of Gethsemane, by the way, is another extended picture of Jesus' kind of quiet times. 
of what that looks like. He goes in, the inner wrestle, the vulnerability comes out with the conviction of God's will and, and this is what I'm going to do. He surrenders and submits, honors the Father. Life um, lived with purity and character of Jesus. Think of the way Jesus responds to people when they treat him badly, which happened all the time, when they didn't honor him as they should have, or the way Jesus um, challenges people. Not just that he does, of course he does, but what's the way that he challenges the people that he challenges? What's the way he affirms those people as they get things right? Or the way that he ministered to people, the way that he taught, as we've said, with authority and power. Think of the way that Jesus healed. There is a way of doing healing that we learn from Jesus, who is our model and guide. There is a way of dealing with evil that we learn from Jesus, who is our model and guide. There is a way of doing teaching. There is a way of doing restoration. Think of the way he connected with people who socially were outcasts, and yet he engages with them in a very different way. These and a thousand other things are the things that we learn as an apprentice, and as a disciple of Jesus. And as Ryan mentioned last week, just as there are things in the teachings of Jesus that we'll love, we kind of, yes, you know, you come to church and one of us is teaching on something you really like, you know, and you leave and, oh, Jason, Ryan, that was great. We really loved that. And then there are other times when you come and it's maybe not something that we like as much and it's like, oh, that was a bit tough, you know, or even that was offensive, to the way that I think about things. And it's the same with the lifestyle of Jesus. They're things we just really like. You know, hey, that idea of doing Sabbath and resting and sleeping. I heard someone say the things that we read Jesus doing most in the Gospels is sleeping and eating. You know, it's like, that sounds pretty good. You know, I like this kind of lifestyle. But then there'll be other things that really offend us. Because the lifestyle is very different. But here's the thing. We don't get to design the Jesus we want to follow. There is one Jesus. And we all follow the same one. And what's amazing is, as we all learn to live more like him, we start to look more like one another. But our unity is not in looking like each other. Our unity is looking like him. He's the center and as we incrementally move towards him, we actually find our unity because he is our collective model. Now, the Great Commission ends with a promise. Because you might be listening to this and thinking, hey, you know, living like Jesus, that does sound good, challenging, but exciting maybe, like some of the idea of some of this stuff. But how do we do that? You know, he is Jesus and we are not, which we absolutely agree with, okay? <laughs> So how do, how do we live like Jesus in the way that he lived? Well, there is this promise, isn't there? Matthew 28, 20. Surely I am with you to the very end of the age. Now, that is not just, that is not just like pleasant language to make us feel better. You know? I'm with you hypothetically. It's, I am actually with you. And how is Jesus with us? He is with us by the Holy Spirit. So he goes so that the Spirit can come. So the disciples walked with the flesh, Jesus, and we walk by the Spirit, who is with us and in us to lead us and direct us. Now, you might think, okay, but how does that work? So here is a Jason parable to try to get to this. So let's just imagine that there are two friends who are builders, okay? Uh, and they work together, they kind of have a shop together, they each have their, their own shop uh, with all kind of identical tools. Let's call the one Joshua and the other Abel, okay? Uh, and they get called out to this emergency, something's happened, and Joshua is not going to be able to stay the entire time, so he doesn't bring his tools, Abel is able to stay the whole time to sort things out, so he brings all of his tools, and Joshua and Abel come to this emergency. And what's happened, an entire house has fallen down. 
And so Joshua begins to set to work using Abel's tools. They begin to put everything together. Soon the family are there, and they start to help as well. And Joshua is teaching the people to use the tools that he's been using, Abel's tools. And then it comes to the point where Joshua needs to leave. And he says to everyone, don't have to worry. I know it's not finished yet, but now I've trained some of you to use Abel's tools. And Abel's going to stay the entire time, and he's going to let you use all the same tools that I've been using. And and not only are are these people that I've trained going to help you to know how to use the tools, but they're Abel's tools. And he's going to be with you the entire time, and he will help you to use all of the tools and remind you to know how to use them. Because some of these are a bit powerful, you know, and as you can imagine, circular saw, you know, you might not get it right the first time you use it. And that could be dangerous. So, you know, Abel is there. He's going to help you. He's going to show you how this all works. If you ever need a tool, you just ask Abel, and whatever I've used, you can use. And when I come back, we'll finish everything up. Does that make sense? There is no distance learning in Christianity. This is a relational invitation to become a part of the household of God himself. Become a part of the family business, if you like. Co-opted as an apprentice to God, to Jesus, by the Holy Spirit. We do it with him. We live with him, and he lives with us and in us. And so, hopefully, this core value that we would be a relational, family-cultured apprentices to Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit, learning increasingly to live life the way that Jesus did it. You know, this is why... The the first name of the believers in the Bible was the followers of the way. It was a lifestyle as much as it was a teaching. And actually, that's great because Jesus' lifestyle is the yoke that's easy. It's our lifestyle that often does so much damage to us and damage to others. So to be a Christian is incrementally to breathe in the teachings of Jesus to believe them and take them on board, let them shape us, and then breathe out the lifestyle of Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit until we learn to increasingly look more like him. And hopefully, as you look at my life, there are some ways that are similar. And as I look at yours, there are some ways that are similar. And we can learn and grow and follow one another as we follow Christ, to put it into Paul's kind of language. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, let's stand together. I want to pray for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Not sure if any of you have ever done that kind of You watch things on YouTube to see how things are done, and you kind of like feel, I know how to do that now. And then you have the first time when you actually try to do it. And then suddenly, (laughs) what looks so simple in the video kind of feels a bit clunky for us the first time you try, but then the next time, and the next time, and the next time, And it just incrementally becomes easier and easier as you practice. And so, God, I pray for a grace to practice the lifestyle of Jesus, to encourage one another. I pray for fresh eyes to read the Bible, not just to see the teachings of Jesus, but to see his lifestyle and the lifestyle of the apostles who were able to imitate him to give us an example of something to follow. God, would you show us how to take off the yoke of our lives that can often do so much harm to us and to receive yours, your way of life, 
that is restorative, is peace-giving, full of love and grace and joy and mercy. Thank you, Jesus, that your ways aren't just ways of power, but also ways to grieve, ways to be compassionate, ways to show mercy, ways to release truth, ways to overcome evil. Thank you, Lord. Ways to bless. Ways to speak life to the things of God and even to speak death to the things that are against God. That there would be freedom and peace and hope and joy in our hearts and in this community. God, would you give us grace to do alone time with you? Teach us. We struggle, Lord, just like your disciples struggled. And yet we thank you that, Holy Spirit, you are with us to teach us, to remind us, to empower us, to strengthen us. Show us, God. Just, I had a real sense that there are people where there's been a real disappointment that you've not seen certain fruit in your life of the kingdom. And it's like the Lord saying, but I'm going to help you to grow the tree first and start with the seed <laughs> and journey with me to let it grow. And trust me, the fruit will be there in the process. And so, Lord, I pray if there's been disappointment or disillusionment at any point, and we've maybe been angry with you even, God, I just, I pray you forgive us where we've tried to do your things but not your way. We've tried to do it our own way. And you are wanting us to do it your way. God, we want you to be Lord of our lives. And so, Father, would you come in Jesus' name, shape us, disciple us, help us to be your apprentices. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.